I always love that part. The meeting is being recorded. <laughs> all right. Gang's all here. This is Watch Me Work. I'm SLP from my mother's house today. Um, we are doing, we've been doing Watch Me Work for 11 years um, uh, from the lobby of the public theater mostly. And uh, we've also done it all around the world. But um, we just want to give a big thanks to the public theater for supporting this show, this project, this experiment that I've been doing for the past 11 years. And we also want to thank Howl Round, who came on a few years ago to help us live stream and from the lobby of the Public Theater and recently has come on to help us create this beautiful uh, online community through the COVID crisis. Um, so we, we are very appreciative to both those organizations. Today, today, we're not just going to work. Today, we have an incredibly fabulous special guest. We have uh, Chiara Alegria Hudis, and uh, she's amazing. And she is going to take your questions. But first, I want to tell you about her. Uh, you know who she is, but we're going to tell you all about her anyway. She's a writer, a strong wife, and a mother of two, a barrio feminist, and a native of West Philly, USA. She's hailed for her work's exuberance, her work's intellectual rigor, and rich imagination, and her plays and musicals have been performed all around the world. They include Water by the Spoonful, which is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Drama, right on, sister, In the Heights, which is the winner of the Tony Award for Best Musical and a Pulitzer Prize finalist, um, and Elliot, A Soldier's Fugue, which is another Pulitzer Prize finalist. Her most recent musical, Miss You Like Hell, was not only beautiful and gorgeous, I saw it, it appeared off-Broadway at New York's uh, Public Theater, and uh, Hudis wrote the screenplay adaptation for In the Heights. Oh, cool, we got to talk about that. So you, she was originally trained as a composer, dig that, and she writes at the intersection of music and drama. She's collaborated with mu renowned musicians, including Lin-Manuel Miranda, and the Cleveland Orchestra. So um, Hootie's recently founded Emancipated Stories, which seeks to put a personal face on mass incarceration by having inmates share one page of their life story with the world. So we're thrilled that you're joining our, our uh, merry and hardworking group today. And what we're going to do, just so everybody knows, is we're going to work together for 20 minutes and then we're going to talk with Kiara about her work, and then she will answer your questions about your work and your creative process. So that's how we're going to do it today. Um, and if you should have a question, Audrey's going to tell you how to get in touch. Go, Audrey. Thanks, SLP, and welcome, Kiara. We're so glad to have you. Um, so thank you. Yeah, uh, um, everybody. So uh, as a reminder, if you are inside of the Zoom and you have a question, all you need to do is click on the participant tab. It's likely on the bottom of your screen if you have a laptop or the top of your on an iPad or a tablet. Uh, you click on that participant tab, and inside of it is a little raise your hand button. Click on that. A little blue hand appears, and I'll call on you if we've got time. Um, and if you're watching on HowlRound.tv, you can tweet at us at, at WatchMeWorkSLP with the hashtag HowlRound, H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D. Um, or you can tweet at the Public Theater, which is at Public Theater NY. Or you can write the Public Theater's um, Instagram right into our messages. And that's it. All right. All right. So here we go. We're going to work for 20 minutes. And then we're going to talk to Kiara about her work. And then she'll take your questions. Here we go. Ready, Audrey? Mm.
right, all right. Here we go. Hopefully you guys got some work done in those 20 minutes. And uh, we're going to talk to Kiara about her work first. I want to know, Kiara, what you working on right now, sis? What's happening with you? Um, hi, Susan. SLP. What a thrill to be here and to, and to um, you know, talk about the water cooler. Here we are. This is beautiful. <laughs> This is really beautiful. Um, I'm working on a memoir right now. So mm -hmm. it comes out um, in April of 2021. So we're in the final work copy editing. So we're in the very final stages of the writing process. Uh huh. So you write in lots of different kinds of forms, huh? Yeah, you know, um, I needed a little break a few years ago. So mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. uh, I hit pa press pause on my beloved theater for a few years. Mm -hmm. I just unpressed pause recently. Uh -huh. But in the meantime, um, dug into this memoir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you also write for the screen. I mean, you, uh, one thing you adapted in the Heights. Amazing. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. It's coming out soon, right? I mean, did I get we passed the we passed the date that it's supposed to come out, and oh. so um, we have moved theatrical release to next summer. They they really oh. wanted to do a theatrical release and not mm -hmm. do a streaming release, so uh -huh. we uh -huh. decided to wait, be patient, and wait, and and you know oh. hopefully there will be movie theaters open next summer. <laughs> yeah, there will be. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm praying for that too. Which do you do you have a preference? Do you like writing for the stage, writing memoirs? writing for the screen do you have a preference on which you enjoy more it's all very different right and for me it's the it's the process is different um but the process with writing different like every play is different too for me the difference is more just personal and mm -hmm. um so for the the screenwriting is really fun i will for me the screenwriting is just joyous a fun job. Um, the the theatrical work feels a little bit more um, like spiritually informed mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, purposeful and intentional in terms of uh, creating a body of work that I think is important and that I want to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found with my first book, working on this memoir, um, that that process that what I just described in theater because it's because it's a memoir because it's about myself feels mm -hmm. even more um heightened and high stakes because mm -hmm. I'm doing that process internally like I'm the script and the audience and the performers I'm, I'm every part of that mm -hmm. so um mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's the difference for me mm -hmm. how about how about how does that all compare to writing a musical you know yeah, you know, I've written um, a few different musicals. I uh -huh. did In the Heights with Lynn. So I wrote the book on that one. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was his baby and his vision. And yeah. I only said yes to, to doing that project <clears throat> with him when I felt that I could bring my own vision and my own deeply personal touch um, to kind of walk in concert with his when we, when we had a, an a, a initial conversation. And I remember thinking like, we could be cousins or something. There, there mm -hmm. felt like there were common goals um, mm -hmm. of the heart and sociological goals and society goals and all those sorts of things. So um, there was that. And then it was really fun. We became mm -hmm. very good friends. Mm -hmm. um, so that was extremely fun. I did a kids musical at the Kennedy Center. And then more recently I did um, Miss You Like Hell at the Public Theater mm -hmm. and um, those all feel different. The, the the main difference for me between, it's so different writing a play and writing a musical. Mm -hmm. And for me, the difference is I feel a little bit more careful and possibly a little bit more inhibited when doing collaborative work mm -hmm. than when I'm just playwriting. When I'm mm -hmm. playwriting, I am always challenging myself to take off the armor as much as possible um, to just put that armor aside and trust. Mm -hmm. um, I want to challenge myself to be as wild as possible uh, when playwriting. Um, I do those things when I'm writing a musical, but because there's other artists involved, mm -hmm. it's slightly different. Like, 
the, the work is always in conversation with someone else. And so I think the challenge of that is to honor someone else's vision mm -hmm. while keeping your vision very specific so that it doesn't become like a watered down version of a number of people's mm -hmm. visions. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit in some ways like more strategic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I never get into like dark a place with it in the musical because if I get into that dark zone and that dark place with it, I have someone to hand it off to and they'll take the baton and they'll run for a week or they'll run for a day or they'll run for a month, you know, whereas uh -huh. with the play, like I'm going on that journey, like uh -huh. I'm packed my backpack. This is all I got, you know, it's mm -hmm. just me. So when, when the storm hits, I hope my tent keeps the rain out sort of thing, you know, it's, it's uh -huh. all on me. Right, right, right. You talked about being on the same page with Lynn sociologic or Politically, I'll just say, you know, yeah. talking being on the same page. Is that always important when you collaborate with people that you you um, need to feel like you're on the same page with them? Not fully, but I think there has to be a common interest, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. a common goal. Um, mm -hmm. For me, that that common goal that exists more than just expressively and artistically, I haven't yet written a piece that I feel like I'm only writing it to be expressive and um, to be artistic. Every piece that I've written so far, and it could change, who knows, but has, I have felt also inside like a very specific and articulated urgency inside about why I think it, it would be a bummer to not have that piece exist in the world. Uh -huh. um, you know, so that, you know, Lynn and I are very different politically too, but mm -hmm. I think there was a commonality of, of an urgency, of a desire mm -hmm. um, that, that was political, that we, that we had with that, that was exciting. So that you can always return to that. If you're, if you get really lost, right. it's like, okay, well, what's our goal here? Let's right. go back to our goal, right. you know? Right, right, It's different right. than a thesis. It's not like we're, you know, we're not writing an essay. It's not, it doesn't have a thesis. Um, right. I just think that fire in the belly um, has always not just been purely expressive for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear you. That's really great. You want to take some questions from our our workers here? Definitely. Uh -huh. right. This is Amy. beautiful. Yeah. I'm like scrolling through. I'm like, look, I, I love, look at all these faces. This I know, the beautiful faces here and the beautiful work. Yeah. What do we got, Audrey? We've all right. Great. We've got Melania up first. Okay, girl. Go ahead, Robert, Melania. Hello, hello everybody. Hello, Susan, Kiara. Thank you for Hi, Melania. Here. Hi, nice to meet you. And I am so happy and honored that you are with us today. Thank you for coming. I would My like pleasure. to first to share with you and everybody something that was very nice to me, a discovery that I made this morning within my work. I was having problems with some notes of a workshop that I was doing in Argentina. I am from Argentina. Um, and I was writing and Susan Lori helped me a lot and all our group. And she wow. said to me to, to leave the work and she always said not to us that when we are having this problem, these struggles, we can leave the work, let it rest and then come back. So I did that with this uh, work from the workshop is a theater play for children in Spanish. Um, Suddenly today I said, okay, I'm going to take it. And when I took it, I began to, to read and I found myself laughing at what I was reading. <laughs> I said, this is, this, yeah, this is fun. This, and there was a moment like this, uh, I wrote this. And Hell yeah. Yes, and that was so, so nice. So first I wanted to, to share this with Susan, with you, with all my classmates. And after that, 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 that feeling that I have made me think about something that I would like to ask you. And it's about the, our own voice, my own voice. How, how to find and how do you work with that? Because I saw something there in some part of what I read that I said, wow, this person writes very nice, but I didn't recognize myself. And I said, wow, this is me also. So what I would like to, to keep doing with my work uh, is to, to find this voice and these things that I want to tell the world. You know, I come from Argentina. It was not easy for me to come here and in love with my husband and a very nice life, three daughters. 
But at the same time, so many new things that I, I feel that I have something in me that they want to express. And I am trying to, to learn how to do that. So I show up to my work, as Susan Laurie always says, and I try to do that. But I would like to know your experience in finding your own voice. And if you have any suggestions to me to keep doing this work. Yeah, I mean, this that is ongoing. So as long as I, I assume, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 42 and so I'm that many years into showing up to the work. And of course my process changes over time, but um, the process of finding the voice is ongoing. That's the daily work actually, right? Um, because admittedly, some people are probably more self-aware than I am, but I know in the process of writing my memoir, for instance, mm -hmm. I thought, I, I thought I knew who I was and I thought I knew what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, I knew this part of that, but you know, then I realized, oh, but that's kind of covering up this other thing. And actually that's kind of covering up this thing. And then I started getting to layers that were so much at the core of me and my voice that I had never really told myself or put on the page or articulated. And that's about the story, that's about the themes, but that is also about the language too, right? So you found yourself um, being delighted by your own voice and surprised and saying, oh, this person uh, really, this person really nailed it. But wait, that's me, which I love because we're, you know, if, if anything, we're very complicated. There's so many lives within us. There's so many stories within us. There's so many, um, I feel that my characters, my family members are me also. So there's so many people within us. There's so many languages within us, you know, especially like, how do you, what is language on this street corner for you? What is language with that at that family's house for you? What is language when you, you know, go to apply for the job for you? What is language when, you're unfamiliar with, you know, even like there's, we have so many languages in our lives. And so you have all of that to access, right? As you are creative and as you continue to find your voice. But for me, that's not an arrival. That is a continued path, the voice finding. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Kiera. Thank you. Sure, good luck. Thank you, you too. Thanks, Melania. Um, we're going to go to Carla. Um, Hello. Carla. Hi, Susan. Hi, Carla. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kiara. Nice to meet you. Um, nice to meet you. I was going to start by saying, um, so I saw Miss Yuleko, I ushered out the public. Yeah. And I was working the first time I saw it. And I had to leave before the ending, even though I was working. And I looked at my manager and she was like, and I was in full tears crying because I'm Puerto Rican and I have a lot of mother daughter issues. So I mm. came outside and uh, she looked at me. She was like, I know <laughs> like there mm. was complete forgiveness in terms of like, I know you can't do the work right now. It's too emotional to like, mm. look at this every night. It was incredible. Um, and um, uh I guess my question has to do with that because I, I'm writing a lot of things. There's a project that I'm writing now that has nothing to do with my life. But I, when I first started this writing process, I started writing about that relationship, that mother-daughter relationship that's personal to me. And it's so hard, so hard, much like how I felt at the end of Miss Like Hell, just in tears. It's just so difficult to kind of write it down, even though it is encouraged and I'm doing therapy and stuff about it but like to to sort of try and detangle all those emotions and feelings but it's so hard and so I'm wondering how you and Aaron sort of did that <laughs> and how were you mm -hmm. able to detangle that and sort of put it on the page in such a way that was at least to me so raw and emotional that I you know how because I want to I want to see it in some way like that and understand it myself in my my own experience but I don't I don't know sometimes I feel like I get caught up and then emotions start going up because it's I guess my own experience if any of that makes sense <laughs> um but yeah I just 
anytime I try to write it, it's so difficult. And like, I've been going and do other things and other projects like the one I'm working now that's completely different, but it's just so difficult to kind of dig into that. As you were talking earlier about the older layers and getting to certain points where it's so hard to kind of face that I just feel like I get stuck writing wise and sort of hit this wall of like, ah, it's too much or too much emotion, too much situation. So I don't know if you've ever dealt like that in terms of writing for at least the Hispanic community like ours. So I don't know <laughs> if that's a question. Yeah, you know, it's... First of all, Aaron and I, Aaron is the composer of Miss You Like Hell, just so everyone knows this musical that I did at the Public Theater a few years ago and we wrote lyrics together. So I did book and lyrics and she did music and lyrics. And um, we, she and I have very, very different relationships with our mother and um, I don't want to speak too much for her, but she was like constantly triggered throughout the process. It was very hard for her. Mm. Um, I did not, I don't have that fraught relationship. So it was, um, it was not so triggering for me or so complicated for me. Um, that particular mm. component of the story. But I think writing, <laughs> writing out of difficult relationships and mm -hmm. especially difficult relationships that remain central to your life. Mm -hmm. That's a very big challenge um, because you're potentially, for one thing, it's very close to you. So it's hard to gain any sort of um, perspective on it. And for another thing, there's also perhaps the fear that this act of writing will um, jeopardize an important relationship in your life. Um, mm -hmm. So those are two things that are working at the same time. Right. And in terms of the first one, in terms of it being too close and not having perspective and getting too caught up in the difficulty, I've definitely been right. there and experienced that. Um, and I've, I've done writing in that state that I have been displeased with and don't like very much. And I've done writing in that state that I feel very good about. And um, mm. I, I could say the difference is that I had to, when I'm writing about other people or other characters, I feel I can be right there with them and I can speak for them. There's this kind of like possession vibe or advocacy vibe. You know, if someone comes at you and is insulting you, it's one thing. If someone comes at someone you love, and is insulting mm. someone you love, it's like, I will take you. I will take you right now. I will, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, 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 yeah. So for it's easier for me to be there with someone else when I'm when it's close to me. What I have found is that like to step outside of myself mm. as a spirit, as a conscious being, and observe myself in that relationship. And just to note, to, this is a process thing, this is an everyday thing, what do I observe about myself? What do I see? Just be very descriptive and honest. Not, mm. what does it feel like in this relationship with my mom or going through this memory with my mom or trying to write the scene with my mom? What do I observe in myself having that experience? And so being, trying to have a process where you can incorporate both of those states of consciousness, being in the relationship that's difficult and observing who you are and what that experience is, that could be very helpful because then you can spend a day as the observer. You know, you can spend a day. I was, I was, I was looking through my journal during this. That was my, that was my work for 20 minutes. And mm -hmm. I talk about being the sentinel a lot in my own life. Um, like holding watch, watching out over my own life. That gives me a little bit of remove. And then I can step back into the complicated mess because you have to write from the complicated, messy part too, or else it's not going to be real. Um, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. Well, thank you so much. That's really helpful because I feel like I've been so kind of in it that I just I haven't stepped out of myself. And that's a, that's a really good point. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> therapy yeah. is a great place to do that work. Um, I <laughs> yeah, use, yeah, yeah. Therapy, I use meditation. I use prayer. Um, I use hiking. Um, I use just breathing, just sitting and breathing. So I, I have different, I, I, there's certain music I listen to that is, um, 
like spiritual music from a particular practice. And so all of those things help me get into a space where I'm either feel brave enough to be in the difficulty or I feel enough clarity and peace to be observing. Those things help me on just a kind of nuts and bolts level. Okay, awesome. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And thank you for your work, both in the Heights and Michelle Kelas of Puerto Rico and I, uh, with beautiful work. So thank you thank so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Carla. Um, all right, up next we've got Kimmy. Are you there? Oh, sorry, we're having a, oh, there we go. Can you hear me today? Yeah, hi. Did I do it right? You're good, we can't Did see, oh, there you are. Yay, hi. <laughs> I'm strolling through. I like just so I can potentially see your face, Kimmy, as as you talk. I'm the but... shortest one. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, if you go back to the main page, Kara, she'll pop up underneath underneath you because she's talking more now. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of everybody. I'm four foot eleven, so I'm pretty sure I'm the shortest one in the class. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let me get to speaker view. Maybe that will help. Yay! Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I really am honored to have the opportunity to speak and always with SLP's class. So thank you. I, um, I have no representation. I have a play that's uh, burning a hole in my uh, drawer. And I also just, uh, because of Susan Laurie's class and everything, I um, uh, finished a pilot. I got an idea for a pilot. And so now I have to do the pitch deck and all that fun stuff, fun stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and so how does one go get past the not representation? You know, I'm 50 years old and, um, I've shown my work to a lot of people, um, in the industry, you know, we did readings and stuff with um, some really classy actors and things. Um, so now I, I'm kind of stuck on my next step, uh, how to get it in somebody's proper hands. Are, are you asking this about the play or are you asking this about the pilot that you finished? I don't care which, uh, which answer you give me <laughs> more than I know. Uh, no. <laughs> whatever, whatever help you can provide me with. <laughs> like, do um, I, so do I take my play and I do it on the bathroom wall and some well, like in, 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 you know, Times Square where people will see it or how do you get it out there? Yeah. Um, so I didn't get an agent until I had my first production. And then when I had my first production that then I had a contract that I needed to deal with. So I was like, I better get an agent now. So I didn't have an agent to help me get that first production. Um, it kind of the other way around. And, you know, I, what I did was I, I did two things. One is I self-produced. So my first production, um, and in doing that, I met, this was when I don't live in Philadelphia anymore, but I'm from Philadelphia. At the time I lived in Philadelphia. So I met, um, like I joined a local acting class. I, no one could have less acting aspirations than me, but I joined <laughs> it to meet local actors. And right. I figured like actors direct a lot too. So I figured some of them would be directors. And in doing so, I met a director for my piece. I met someone else who wanted to start their own theater company. So they produced it. And so I didn't self-produce like by myself, but I did it kind of on the ground level with um, with people that I met. And so I didn't feel like I had to sit around waiting for someone to like read it and decide it was worth putting on a main stage or something like that. That was great. Um, and those are connections I still work with to this day. And then the other thing I did was I also sent the script around to different theaters. Um, but how I did that was I Googled the I Googled the plays that I felt like most closely aligned with what my piece was and mm -hmm. saw where they had been produced. And then like I Googled, um, Jose Rivera has a play called Sonnets for a New Century or it might be Sonnets for an Old Century. I can't remember. It's an incredible play, by the way. I highly recommend reading it. Um, and I thought that was a little similar because it was more of a poetic structure. It didn't have like, 
you know, a beautiful Aristotelian arc. So, and so I was like, okay, maybe a theater that did this crazy piece would be interested in mine. And then I looked at the websites and I saw which of them accepted like 10 pages versus a full play. And I sent out a bunch of plays that way and a very, very small theater um, in Portland, Oregon picked it up and was like, okay, we'll do it and we'll pay you, you know, $70 and blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> that again, like I worked with them for years and I, that was really important for me to do that work. And, you know, could I have paid my mortgage off of that? No, no. Right. Um, I was working right. other jobs at the time. Um, that being said, like there was also like oddly more freedom, artistic freedom in those kind of scrappy endeavors. And so then I had a like, I had like a one or two page letter of um, contract from this theater. And I, I found an agent who didn't take me on by the way, but was like, I'll look at your letter and see if it's okay. Said the letter was okay. And then I went back to that agent when I kind of kept um, pushing my stuff from there and sent some reviews around and got like a, like a real like Vorty regional pr production. Um, the other thing that I did was, I don't know if, do, do people still send like rejection letters in the snail mail or is, is this all done over email now? I, I don't know the answer I, I to that, but I have no idea. I, I have um, email. Yeah. <laughs> through email. Well, back in the day, I did this thing where it's like, if I got a lot of, so many rejection letters and some of them were clearly, so clearly form letters. Like this person either didn't read my play or read two pages of it or read the whole thing and decided that um, it just, they had no interest in even making a comment on it. It was so not their cup of tea. So I would get this like super form letter back. But then there was this category of rejection letter that was like, here's what your play made me think of. Like th that was actually like started a little bit of a conversation. So I kept those oh. theaters in mind saying like, okay, they actually read and thought about the work. I'm gonna send them like my next play or send them an update if this play gets done and like gets a review or like gets, mentioned in some way or gets a production like so I kept those people updated and some of those five or six years down the line did end up turning into a production or commission that's wonderful thank you so much those are great answers and what a scrappy little way to figure stuff out I love that <laughs> <laughs> I'm a stand-up comic and I started producing shows myself because I could never I didn't want to drive two hours to LA for five minutes a time you know? Right. Yes. Yes. You Thank know, you I couldn't so much. answer that so much for TV because it's, it's not so scrappy an industry and I don't know how to like, break, yeah, that's like break into that industry in the same way. I'm Thank you. grateful. Thank you. So it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. We've got about eight minutes left um, and we are going to go to Mary. Hi. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, okay, so this kind of um, piggybacks on Kimmy's question, and it definitely piggybacks from a couple of weeks ago, Melania asked Susan Laurie a, a question, or Susan Laurie's response um, is similar. So it's about um, copywriting and when you are asking other people to read your work. Okay, so here's mm. my situation. Um, I, I'm working on a play. I've been working on this play. It's just been getting bigger and bigger over the past probably, probably three years, two and a half to three years. And the people that I have shared it with um, and received feedback from have really nurtured and been supportive and I've gotten wonderful um, critical feedback from their perspective. Um, and I, a few months ago, I met somebody who might, uh, it was like a, you know, a, uh, here's two people, I think you guys should be friends. You know, you're both actors, you're both in the theater. And well, then the pandemic hit, I don't really know her, um, mm -hmm. but she's connected to, um, other people, she's like, oh yeah, we should we should read your play. We should all get together. And pandemic hit, we sort of lost touch. 
but she has access to a lot of professional actors. I live in central New Jersey and in um, a small university town and it's, I don't, the, that pool, it's hard to get, uh, get together with people. I don't know as many people, but in terms of um, trusting people with my work at this point, it's, it's unfinished. So that's mm. a question of mine, like, um, you know, how do I, how do I own it, but also, um, get expand my pool of, of feedback and, and how I hear it. And so I'm finished. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I really think you could ask 20 different playwrights this question and you would get 20 different answers. Mm -hmm. um, because in my experience, all of my playwriting friends have very different relationships with receiving feedback. Um, so I only say that to say, take my answer with a grain of salt and maybe ask a few other playwrights um, their, their thoughts on this too. So it's, it's completely um, normal to send out a play that's in progress and that's quite any level of unfinished, you know, and to ask for, um, you know, to say, can we gather and read it? Would you check this out? Would you be interested in that? I think to protect yourself and like your ego and also just to create a clear boundary and let them know what's going on. Always say, this is a very early draft. This is a work in progress. Just make it clear what stage of development is that for you. Um, you know, act, the actors should have familiarity with reading a script that what I call a skeleton draft. So oftentimes mm -hmm. my first draft of a play is 40 pages and it will become 100 pages you know where it's like the scenes are really short but it kind of has the essence of the play sort of mm -hmm. thing um and sometimes I need to sometimes I don't need to hear those out loud but sometimes I do because sometimes I get to that like skeleton draft and I'm actually not totally sure the basic idea works and hearing it out loud will help me answer that question and I've even done that in front of like an audience which feels very vulnerable, but I really was wondering with one play, like, is this even a play mm -hmm. kind of thing? Um, I think for me, what's important at every step, but especially early on, if you're like still feeling vulnerable about it is to decide very early on what kind of feedback you want and make that really clear to people. So, and also like actually be really honest about what kind of feedback you want. Um, mm -hmm. So I say that to say that like I, my tendency can be towards being more of a people pleaser. And that has shot me in the foot a few times where, you know, I thought with an early draft and as a playwright, like my job was to be like, I, I want, I want your feedback. Like I need it, like help me develop it. And then I kind of realized a few years until like, no, I don't like, there might be a question I have, but do I really want to hear from seven people their different opinions and answers on what that should be? Or do I just need to know that question for myself, listen and force myself to answer the question, mm -hmm. you know? And so all that is to say at the beginning of, uh, let's say you're gonna do like a Zoom reading of the piece or, you know, a socially distant reading, like to, to with, with grace and gratitude for people joining, you know, to help, to just, just lay out exactly and clearly where you are, you know, say, this is the first draft of something that I feel I might have another year of writing on. I might have another six months. I might have two breakthroughs of writing ahead of me. So I just want to hear it. And I think I don't want any feedback, but I brought you guys pizza or, you know, like, or I'll make a donation to your favorite thing. Um, or say like, I do want feedback, but only about this one particular plot question I have like just be really mm -hmm. clear at the beginning and that will also help them they'll if, if they hear you say I don't want feedback they'll just read the thing and be into it if they hear you say I want feedback about this particular thing they'll read with that in mind you know so that will help them direct their energy energy during that too mm -hmm. all right thank you thank you Kiara
Welcome. Thanks, Mary. Um, so we actually only have about 30 seconds left, which doesn't feel like enough time. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for being here with us. This was wonderful. Thanks, Kara. You were great. Come back oh, anytime. Thank anytime. you so much, Lori. Thank you. you. So this fabulous. is a real blessing, oh, a real pleasure. You're a real blessing. <laughs> <laughs> as a reminder everybody please sign up by 3 p.m eastern every day monday uh, tuesday to thursday and we will uh, get you a link between uh, 3 and 4 30 p.m eastern thank you so much kiara thank you everybody thank, thank you, you slp thank you thanks guys have a great evening <laughs>